And welcome to The Napoleonicist and the second instalment of a special feature for you on what we've irreverently called Boney's Boys in Spain. If you haven't listened to episode one already, you will find an absolute riot of an episode with my good friend Josh Proven, who also joins me on this one. Josh runs the uh, brilliant YouTube channel Adventures in Historyland, has an encyclopedic knowledge of all things military history. He's basically a walking Wikipedia of military history knowledge, <laughs> but actually knows what he's talking about, unlike the fools who edit Wikipedia. No offence if you're one of those fools who edits Wikipedia, but some of the stuff on there is <laughs> palpably nonsense. Um, so the premise for this is that we're going to do a series of episodes looking at a number of Napoleon's marshals. And we're factoring this into Napoleon Month because it is obviously important to look at the types of people that Napoleon sent out to do his bidding and had under his immediate command. We've talked already in the first instalment about Soult, Victor, Massena and Ney. And today we're going to focus on Marmont, Jourdain and Suchet. Josh, great to have you back. How have you been in the three minutes since we finished recording episode one? Well, it's been, been a tough, it's been tough and it's been good. It was the worst of times and the best of times. Uh, uh, and I was pondering to myself, what a walking encyclopedia would physically look like? And I decided it would look quite scary. So you're, you're coping okay from the withdrawals of, of the last episode, all of about 30 seconds ago? Well, it's, I'm not going to lie to you, Zach, it's been tough, but uh, I've, I've managed to get through. That's all right. I'm here to help you scratch that Napoleonic martial itch, if such a thing ever existed. Now, we're going to, <laughs> to head straight back in. We discussed in the first episode about the nature of the Marshall Sea, um, for those who are struggling to kind of orientate themselves here. So I would urge you, go back and have a listen to that first episode. But we're going to kick off with Marshal Marmont. We're roughly going through these in a sort of chronological order, having looked at, at Salt, Victor, Mass and Ney, um, all of whom at least have their first contact with uh, the British forces in the early part of the Peninsula War. Marmont is a, a different character. I'm going to be honest straight away. I like Marmont. I've always had a huge amount of respect for the guy. Ever since I first uh, started researching properly this period and looking at the, the Salamanca campaign, and I can't help but feeling that he's treated very harshly. He has the title the Duke of Ragusa, uh, but because he surrendered Paris to the Allies in 1814, the French have a verb for betray, which is raguser. So if you are betraying someone, you are doing a raguser. You are literally doing a marmont, which seems quite harsh to me. He was very close to Napoleon, uh, widely considered to have been Napoleon's protege, was with him from the start pretty much. He was at Toulon, was an aide to Napoleon in Italy and Egypt was one of those loyal few um, who returned from Egypt uh, with Napoleon when Napoleon went off to conduct his coup in France, was made a general over the course of that campaign um, after taking what well, his involvement in the taking of Malta, general of division at Marengo. This is a guy who does very well, is very close to Napoleon, and I think he's quite underrated. Um, I'm struck by something that Rory Muir said recently, which was that he was very good up until the point when he wasn't, which isn't an official quote from Rory, I, I should add, but is a, a great, it was made on Twitter, so don't start sticking that in, in your, uh, your research on the period, but is a great way of kind of describing the guy. Josh, I've spoken far too much already. Your thoughts on, on Rag user? Hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, that was a brilliant nugget that I came across as well. To you, you're pulling a marmot if you're uh, if you're being disloyal. You are. He is Francis Benedict Arnold. Apparently, this is this is this is this is terminology. If you if you betray someone in America, you are Benedict Arnold. If you do it in France, you are Raguzer. Um Fascinating that. Yeah, he, uh, Marmor, I agree. He's, uh, I've always quite liked Marmor. Um, he, and like many of the marshals who we have discussed, they're all solid soldiers. They're all good until a certain point. 
this common this point of commonality is a gentleman by the name of the duke of wellington almost invariably and he is the reason why these men are not considered great soldiers um of the, in the napoleonic wars he he basically stains them with the with the stigma of defeat and usually quite embarrassing defeats and none more so than poor marshal andre uh, sorry uh, poor marshal uh, Maman. and he's and it's because of salamanca this is the worst luck um uh yet up until that day uh when the battle kicked off he did everything right um uh, he, uh, as you said, he was uh, sort of a wonder child. He was the youngest of the marshals. He was a general division at 26. He was one of the ones who was a little angry with his buddy, and they were quite good friends, Napoleon, for not being a marshal in 1804. But he got it in 1809, uh, hence, his, hence his title as well, I believe. Uh, which is uh, derived from some something he did something he did in Italy at some point, which I forget precisely what it was. I think he was forcing the Russians away from the city of Ragusa. Um, oh yes, he lifted the siege or something, wasn't it? So, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's this kind of vague thing, <laughs> but he was also an artillery command. He was an artillery artilleryman by nature, so he was very much like Napoleon in that sense. He was, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, some of the things I wrote down about him is like, he was energetic, calculating, um, very skilled officer, very capable officer. And unlike some of the other marshals who went to Spain, except for, except for Sultan, Sultan Massena, um, of the ones we just talked about, he actually had independent victories to his name uh, previous to coming out. So victories where Napoleon was not present to tell him what to do. And when he got to, when he got to Spain, he did, the, he did the, he did the thing where you capture a bunch of forts. And then he was stuck with the problem of the disunited nature of French command in Spain. Nobody really knew who was actually in effective command. Was it the king? Was it his chief of staff? Was it the new guy? Uh, that Napoleon had sent out was it like Soult who was still hanging around somewhere in the north I think uh, it's like it's just a mess so that how do you how do you how do you manage your logistics how do you get an army to function properly when you can't get it to cooperate with the rest of the forces meanwhile a united army is barreling towards the Portuguese frontier and it's taking cities at a frightening speed as well before they can be relieved so obviously in a thrice, practically, Wellington takes Badajoz and Ciudad Rodrigo with uh, you know, infamous uh, results, but nevertheless, he takes them very fast and he presses into, into, into Spain. Now, Marmor has to face this. And this is, this, is, this is where actually he shines very brightly. He, he comes up against Wellington and he matches him for while, for, for guile and, 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 and skill in maneuver. Every time, every time Wellington turns, he's there before him. He anticipates where he's going to go and he blocks him. He, they're both jockeying for position. It's a fascinating little part of the campaign where it's actually not clear who has the upper hand until, until he just, again, as is such the case with the marshals, he makes a right call based on wrong intelligence. And he does this in the face of an enemy who is prepared to attack. That is, he thinks Wellington is retreating. He's not. He's just moving forces as he has been all the last couple of weeks. And he presses on to try and head him off. This overextends his left flank and allows Wellington to basically uh, defeat him in detail. And he does this as Salamanca now. One of the big questions of Salamanca, of course, is had a Royal Artillery shell not intervened on the, uh, on the, uh, I think it's the, uh, they had, he was on the Arapire Grande, wasn't he? He was, yeah. Was it the lesser one? 
No, it was, yeah. the, it was the British, uh, well, because the British hold the lesser, and the, there's a, a yeah. phase very early on where Wellington misconstrues the greater Arapilo as a a lesser prize, and so focuses on the lesser, occupies that, and then suddenly sends, um, I forget who he sends forwards, but he sends troops forwards to, to try and take it, only they arrive too late to, yeah, to get yeah. there first. Exactly, yes. So had an outer shell intervened in the proceedings, wounding Marmor quite badly and removing him from the field, could he have at least mitigated the, um, well, the unfolding disaster? Could he maybe have maybe only lost one division or had one division broken and maybe stopped the others and maybe maybe been able to put up a defense because it was not a bad position. He had the heights, you know, he had troops that could have defended them. Maybe if he could have made it over there to his extreme left, he could have uh, staunched, staunched the bleeding perhaps, but mm. we can't know because it's actually unclear as to when he began to take things, realize things were going wrong. And then undoubtedly a shell uh, wounded him and several of his staff, wounded his successor as well. I think it was General Bonnet. And um, everything went to pot for the French until Clausel managed to co co cobble together a, a counterattack, which kind of staved off utter defeat. And Clausel himself is wounded. I mean, it is, talk about lucky shots from the artillery, but it's the, the artillery's <laughs> kind of shining moment of the conflict in many respects. You have uh, Marmont, Clausel and Bonnet, all of whom are taken out by, by British artillery. It's incredible. Um, but as you say, I mean, I would actually go further. I would say he was winning that campaign. Um, a couple of yeah. moments occurred to me. We have to bear in mind that he comes to power, if you like, as commander of the Army of Portugal. He takes the command in the aftermath of Fuente de Onuro. And it strikes me that Marmont was a very careful individual. He kind of saw a pattern that if you gave Wellington what he wanted and attacked him on ground of his choosing, it didn't go well. And so as a result of that, he wasn't prepared to give Wellington that. And the, the demonstration of that was at San Cristobal when mm. Wellington's army deployed. And there's a, a little attempt made to try and kind of tempts um, the other side in and it, it doesn't actually play out neither side is willing to budge and so Marmont pulls his army back behind the Duero abandons um, two forts that Wellington has been besieging inside Salamanca they're basically fortified convents but they're very solid structures um, loses those men in the process but does absolutely the right thing and then after Wellington chases him to the Duero does this incredible thing. He catches Wellington on the hop. It's a bit like Salt in the Pyrenees, for my liking, in that Wellington doesn't quite know what's happening. There's a feint um, across one of the fords, and then in an incredible piece of force marching, that force withdraws, marches along the northern bank of the Duero, recrosses the Duero uh, further up, and effectively what Marmont has done is turned Wellington's flank. And there's this horrendous scramble that Wellington's in, trying to pull his army back and form a new defensive line. And Marmont was very disappointed that he didn't kind of get more out of it. Um, and then, as you say, Salamanca, in, in the aftermath of that manoeuvre, the, the parallel marching, where these two forces are within cannon shot almost of one another, neither side making a mistake. Marmont actually gets to, um, oh, what's the river that flows through Salamanca? The, the Thomas, yes, yeah, the Thomas. Um, yes, the Thomas, I think. Crosses the Thomas first, is effectively turning Wellington's flank again. He's managed to outmarch him. Um, and then is continuing that sweeping manoeuvre around, if you like, the, the side of the Allied army, keeps marching to the west. And it is such a small mistake. It's a couple of divisions that go too far, too fast along the high ground. And uh, I want to take a moment to dwell on what I affectionately call Salamanca chicken, because those of you who were uh, on social media a little while back might remember that uh, a few of us who talk about Peninsula Warrior type stuff were discussing 
the concept of of a dish called salamanca chicken the reason that we're focusing on chicken is because uh, there is a very famous story that Wellington saw these two units, uh, Thermier and McCune, had marched too far, were isolated from the rest of the French force, was eating a chicken leg and abandoned dinner, threw the chicken over his shoulder, said, by God, that'll do, and, and rode off to speak to the, the commander of the 3rd and 5th Division um, to instigate the attack. And so we, we were discussing what would it take to, what type of dish should, should Salamanca chicken be if we we're going to create a dish to celebrate the, the British success. There were discussions that the chicken should be thrown over the shoulder into whatever cooking utensil uh, would be best appropriate. Um, it needs to be cooked within 40 minutes. Um, some good French wine should probably feature it in some respect. So if you are a chef and you have a, an idea for how to make the, the most out of Salamanca chicken, mm -hmm. Drop me a line and we'll we'll try to host some kind of grand dinner or a Salamanca anniversary at some point and, and, and try your, your culinary exploits. Um, but enough about the, the silliness of Salamanca chicken. It's it's an incredible move by Wellington. With what you said about the him being wounded, I do wonder to what extent that is a case of saving face. Um, in oh. the sense that he, essentially what he needs to do is order Thermia and McCune to halt and allow time for the other divisions to close that gap, which isn't huge. Um, and that could have been sent by an aide. It, he didn't need to go there in person. Now, of course, it, if it was Wellington, we would have said, well, this is Wellington's command star. He's always in the thick of the action. So perhaps that's unduly harsh to, to, for me to make that criticism of Marmont. Um, if Marmont had been on the ground, it's possible that Topan's division which was to the south a little way, could perhaps have been brought up more swiftly as opposed to just kind of retiring uh, and not really playing much of a role in the, in the battle. Um, but it wasn't a catastrophic mistake. Um, the, uh, for those people who don't know much about Salamanca, I wholeheartedly recommend Rory Muir's book on this, Salamanca 1812, where he is very fair, but also very clinical in looking at the different accounts of the battle and establishing what is true of Salamanca and, and what is hearsay. And he makes the point that this was not a, a catastrophic error. This was a small mistake and it took somebody like Wellington with forces deployed in the way that Wellington had them deployed to capitalize on that success. Um, so I, I wouldn't quite say he was unlucky at Salamanca. And I do think the comments about how he was mounting his horse to ride off um, to issue those counter orders is, is a little bit duplicitous. Um, it's it's certainly convenient, isn't it? Uh, it's a perfect excuse to tell Napoleon if you fudge the timings a little. I was wounded and removed from the battle, uh, so I, you know, not my fault. Um, I. I, I have a certain amount of sympathy for the idea that he was wounded before he could do anything about it. Because just because of what Lieutenant Pocan or Parkin said, how he described the incident, although he doesn't, he doesn't describe when exactly it happened, but he did describe Marmont mounting his horse to ride to the left. For what reason, I don't know. But something happened before things got really bad. This shelf seemed, did seem to interpose itself at that point. I also wonder if the fact he didn't send aides actually kind of proves the point that he was riding himself. So if I was to explain that, it would be to create the scenario that he didn't think anything was going wrong. He got reports or saw that there was action going on on the far left. Not sure what you could see. Not, I'm not sure what he could actually see from that position. So this could all be just rubbish, but you know, um, following through with the idea, he doesn't do anything. Then he realizes something has gone terribly wrong and he might as well ride himself because that's where the danger point is. And that's when the shell hits. But that would be my best way of saying 
that that's my way of saying that if he didn't send that's why he's writing himself because he actually didn't send anybody to um to correct the march i'm with you yeah i mean that sounds entirely reasonable um you could say well should he have had a better handle on his forces the position is strung out at Salamanca, it has to be said. I mean, the army is in a, a seven or eight mile long arc, which is significant for context. Waterloo is a very confined battlefield, it, it bucks the trend. Um, but Waterloo is maybe a couple of miles across, um, yeah, by a not... mile and a half deep. It's, yeah, it's really, it's a really tiny small. field. Um, so you can make the, the argument that, you know, perhaps he's strung his army out a little bit too much. Um, but yeah, I, I don't think, I think you make a good point that if it hadn't been for this consecutive wounding of commanders, Salamanca probably wouldn't have been anything like on the scale of the disaster that it was for the French. Um, th there's no question about that. Um, because a, a commander being in the field and being able to make the relevant decisions could have done the right things. Um, and equally, Clausel deserves a lot of credit for going in with the, when the, the Allied Fourth Division breaks mm -hmm. um, and, and following that up. So the French do the best that they can in a difficult situation. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I think what the scale of what goes wrong for them at Salamanca tends to overshadow just how good the rest of the campaign was. Because if it hadn't been for that mistake, Wellington was back at the Portuguese border. Yeah. It was, in effect, what would have happened at Burgos, except that it wouldn't have been on the scale of the setback that um, heading back from Burgos mm -hmm. to um, Theodore Rodrigo yeah. was for the Allies. I agree. I think Marmo, but basically to deny Wellington access to Spain is winning. And mm -hmm. Marmo was doing that. And that was what he was doing when he, when he, when he extended his left, because he thought, Wellington's going to turn back on himself and try and loop back around. So I'm going to cut him off again. So I'm just putting these divisions in motion as we've been doing every day for the last week and a half or something like that or more. Since he crossed the border, I've been heading him off. He's been turning. I've been trying to get around him. As you said, Mama understood completely. You have to maneuver against Wellington. You cannot be fixed. And it was working. Unfortunately, he maneuvered just a little bit too much, as as you just said, was Roy Moore, as you abbreviated for Roy Moore, he made one mistake, and that was he was doing really well until that one mistake. He really was. Um, of course, having been wounded, he doesn't see action for a little while. He doesn't return to Spain after that. Um, but was it Dresden at Leipzig demonstrated considerable skill? in the fight during the retreats um, in the 1814 defense of France, uh, but then lost at Leon, um, moved too slowly to attack the Allied left there, was caught by surprise by an Allied attack in turn, but in fairness was, Napoleon's whole force was outnumbered by about two to one. Um, so by this point, Marmont's commanding a force of about 10,000 men, um, so far smaller than the army of Portugal that he was handling uh, a couple of years before, which was somewhere in the region of sort of 50, 60,000. Um, so numbers weren't on his side um, on that occasion. The, this is where we get to the Ragusa a bit, isn't it? It is. Yeah. <laughs> and I think it's unfair. Okay, Napoleon was so wounded by this what felt like a personal betrayal, that he did that thing that Napoleon did and he blackened Marmont's name for all time, even though the rest of the marshals had already pretty much begun proceedings to try and end the war there. He was only supposedly persuaded once he found out that Marmont had surrendered. Um, now, I personally think that Marmont again did the right thing. What on earth point? What could he do? What, 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 you know, it's, you know, when people say he was a, he was a vile betrayer and stuff, look at the situation the guy was in. What is anyone humanly supposed to do against, against this amount of opposition with that amount of men with no hope feasibly of actually 
pulling off anything meaningful except extending the war another year or something by which time wellington would be in paris probably and you'd have not three armies but four armies uh, knocking at the door so it's like no it's perfectly understandable disappointing as it is to one who values i guess consistency or something like that or some rush like that but military but in terms of the military situation he had no option absolutely uh, i mean the writing was on the wall you could say that the writing was on the wall much earlier. It would have been the wise thing for Napoleon to do to have taken peace terms rather than to yeah. to roll the dice again, um, as was his way. But that's that's a debate for another day. But I mean, everybody likes to emphasise his disloyalty to Napoleon. But when it comes to loyalty, he stayed loyal to his follow up oath, if you will, which was to Louis the Eighteenth. Um, and in 1815, he doesn't. He's not one of those who switches back to mm -hmm. Napoleon. He's one of those who actually, in the end, votes to execute Ney. Um, so he goes, he goes to Ghent as well in 1815, like Victor. He goes with Louis to, uh, to exile. So another man of his word in many respects. Absolutely. And, uh, but it, he was much like, uh, much like Grouchy uh, and, and, <laughs> and the king of Sweden, uh, <laughs> uh, he he lived the rest of his life under the shadow of uh, this this betrayal of Napoleon, and he he died in exile, I believe, in in Italy, I think, or or Switzerland, or something like that. Uh, he wrote memoirs trying to defend himself uh, and his decisions, and I think a monograph on on modern commanders and things like that. He lived out his life quite comfortably, though, um, generally speaking, but his reputation is first of all tarnished because of the one mistake he made in spain the magnitude of the disaster coloring his reputation so that now people will actually say mama wasn't a match for wellington he was mm. a match for wellington Strongly certainly on the strategic that. level but it's just you do not make if because let's, let's put it this way to sum up whoever made the first mistake was going to pay heavily for that mistake and mama was the one who made the first mistake yeah strongly agree with that, all that you've said there so having rehabilitated or attempted to rehabilitate mama's <laughs> reputation let's let's move on to another jean baptiste jordan so this guy was born into a surgeon's family so not um what you might term peasantry by any stretch of the imagination but nonetheless enlisted as a private in the royal army he has quite a colourful early career, um, fought in the American War of Independence, fought in the West Indies, became sick. He's at Genappe, he's at Fleurus, rose very rapidly during the French Revolution. And he's one of the, the crop of the first batch of marshals, uh, being one of those who's appointed in 1804. Yeah, um, it's a, he's another one of those sort of unclear ones as to he's he's one of the ones that is a bit more unclear as to why he's made a marshal um i think uh except for his long his, his long career in the army and his experience in during the uh the french uh, revolutionary war um he hmm he he because he opposed napoleon's coup and everything as well I believe uh, he wasn't on the side at Brumaire, and he he was a, he did a lot of administrative positions thereafter and stuff. Uh, like a lot of the other marshals, he actually made he actually his experience comes from service in the Royalist Army and in the armies of the Revolution. Uh, so a lot like the early marshals, the 1804 marshals, very that trait is there with him as well. But again, but again, he's one of those ones that you can't quite put a finger on why exactly he gets the baton, but he gets it. And then he does admit, it's mostly administrative positions thereafter, sort of, I think, in 80, after, after he gets to the marshalette. And then he becomes chief of staff to Napoleon's brother in Spain, which is a thankless task. <laughs> Something of a poisoned chalice, isn't it? I mean, he's at Terla Vera. <laughs> yes. We all know how that pans out. He's at Vittoria. Um, now, you could make the argument that he unfairly takes the blame for V 
Vittorio because he advised against forcing the issue. He advised against battle. Um, mm -hmm. the, the mistakes that the French made at Vittorio were considerable. I mean, leaving the bridges intact against a guy like Wellington, knowing about Salamanca, that's, that's not brilliant in terms of forethought. Um, yeah, no, I, I haven't got a huge amount to criticise on, on Jordan, to be honest with you. No, neither do I. There's, there's, neither do I. There's not, uh, there's not even a whole much you can say about him because he's always under the shadow of Joseph. And obviously the rule is if you are in the field and do you have a king in the field, the king is the guy in charge, technically speaking. And Jordan, I don't think Jordan was a terribly good staff of, uh, chief of staff. Uh, I do I have read criticisms that a lot of the confusion that led to Salamanca and Marmol being on his own there is is mostly to do with Jordan's staff work. And uh, but at the same time, if if Joseph isn't being enough of a leader, it's not Jordan's duty to be that leader for him. He's the chief of staff, the king of Spain, in quotes. Um, so the most, he, he certainly, Napoleon certainly blamed him for Vittoria. He had, he had, uh, certainly the, the excuse that I, you know, I, sire, I told, I told your brother not to do it, not to fight here, but, but, you know, I'm just under orders. So it's, it's a, I think it's an open question as to whether he is a Bonaparte, Bonaparte scapegoat or the situation in Spain was just beyond his talents as a chief of staff. Yeah, I mean, it was an incredibly difficult situation, wasn't it? Because Joseph was not the right man for uh, the, the monarchy in Spain. I mean, was there such a person who, who could have taken up that position and done a good <laughs> job? Well, the only contender perhaps might have done well in Spain is the last person we're going to talk about. We'll get to them in a moment. That's Suchet. But uh, out of Napoleon's family, I mean, Joseph didn't want to go. It was always going to anger the Spaniards anyway to add an additional insult. Not only had he arrested the Spanish royal family, not only was he <laughs> taking over their family, he was also imposing an external ruler upon them. Um, and while some were willing to um, work with the French, some Spaniards were willing to work with the French, I'm, I'm not remotely surprised that somebody like Joseph found it a struggle. He'd actually, I would say, done quite well as King of Naples. Um, yeah, yeah. I would agree with that. Um, it's just Spain is just was just such a mess. Why on earth he chose Joseph? Or even, I mean, there was probably more of a case to make one of the marshals king of Spain than one of his family. Maybe Lucien, who was the, like the most talented of the Bonaparte brothers when it came to policy. But it's like, it's just a bad, bad, bad job to get. Uh, it really was. And obviously. And so talking about people who, in fact, the only person really who comes out well from their Spanish career, let's take it on to Suchet. Uh, my notes tell me that he's the Duke of Albuera, which caught me a little bit I by surprise. I, I think it's actually the Duke of Albufera, not oh. Albuera. Very close, though. I, I almost thought it was Albuera as well, but, I, but it's actually, I think, Albuera. Albufer, Albufera, yeah, yes. Probably just yes, illiter Albufera. illiteracy on my part then. But <laughs> uh, as I say, one of the few who doesn't make a, a hash of things in Spain, right, rightly or wrongly, I mean, irrespective of whether or not your that interpretation is harsh, there's no obvious failing of his time in, mm -hmm. in Spain. Admittedly, there's also no instance where he's having to fight the Brits under Wellington which may have a role to play with it. But as a, a leader um, and as a governor of Catalonia, which he is the position that he eventually receives, he does quite well. He's seen as a, a fair leader and he's another one 
long association, uh, is there with Napoleon in the Italian campaign, the first Italian campaign, so at Lodi, Castiglione, Mantua, Arco, Rivoli, uh, was a general of brigade from 1798, married into the Bonaparte family, which was an interesting one. Uh, I think it was Joseph Bonaparte's niece, then became chief of I'm staff. I'm unsure on that, time. but... Mm -hmm. But he, uh, I didn't actually, yeah, no, I didn't actually know he married into the Bonaparte family, actually. That's interesting. Maybe he should have been king of Spain. <laughs> that, that's what I'm kind of thinking as we're, we're discussing it. Perhaps he would have been a better choice. But then he's also at Ulm, Austerlitz, Jena. Um, and his career in Spain is limited to his work in uh, Catalonia, where mm -hmm. he, uh, we should say, becomes marshal in 1811, so the latest of, of all of them. Um, out of the ones that we looked at today, Marmont is the, the next nearest uh, because Marmont gets his marshal seat at Zanaim actually in 1809, just after Wagram. So, uh, I mean, just generally positive. Um, I believe mm. he's responsible for a relatively successful campaign in Valencia, um, mm -hmm. where he's grappling with a smaller British force. Um, which is sent in in 1812 as part of a, a series of diversions to keep other armies in Spain occupied. Um, but then also oversaw a kind of a textbook withdrawal uh, at the, the end of the peninsula when the game was up and the French are pulling back into, back across the Pyrenees. And it was kind of a, a thorn, I always feel, in Wellington's side during that Pyrenees campaign, because you've always got to have one eye on the fact that you've got Suchet uh, with a force, um, and yes, okay, untested against Wellington, but still a threat, and still a significant threat, more importantly. Yeah, this is true, this is true. Uh, I will often, uh, I, so one of the things that's often leveled against Wellington is that he never commanded hundreds of thousands of men. Okay, now I will usually counter that by saying, what, is it, what in his career gives you the impression he couldn't? Now, this I will extend also to Suchet. Now, the main reason he comes out of Spain, I think, with not only he wins his marshalcy in Spain, and he wins his title in Spain. He's the only marshal and French general, I think, to do that. The only reason, I, or the principal reason that this happens, I think, is because he is not opposed to the Duke of Wellington. Therefore, he doesn't get the treatment that all the other great marshals got, and therefore is able to come up the enhanced reputation unusually. But I will extend what I extend to Wellington to him. There's nothing in his career that says that he would not have performed well against Wellington. His record is good, like you say, uh, excellent uh, record against the Spanish armies in Catalonia. Um, a bit of a pounding match to take Valencia, but he does take it. Um, there is a little wobble when he opposes the British at Tarragona. I believe that, it's, I think it's General Murray, not Wellington's Murray, but a different General Murray, actually gets the better of him. But then there's some sort of debacle where he retreats and there's a big court of, a big court martial to do with this because um, actually he tosses it all out the window. I'm curious as to whether this gives an insight as to what he might have been like if he was facing a determined British commander all the time. As you say, he was he had some trouble here with this smaller British army. But overall, he shone in Spain and the only French um, French commander to do so. And like you say, he's always there. I often also like to point out to people who say that Suchet, I often, I do caution people when they talk about Suchet not to take him, uh, not, to, not to take the fact that he was good in Spain as an idea that he was somehow more brilliant than he was. Because while he did nothing wrong and he did a lot of things very well, we should also point out that he may not have been able to actually leave Catalonia to support the others should he needed to, because actually um, I did read somewhere that it is it can be interpreted that he was actually bogged down and couldn't probably extract his men from the province and still hold it. 
and he would want to still hold it. Therefore, he was a threat, but probably not one that could have actually been effective unless unless he was um, able to release those release his forces more freely. But um, his be I mean, his his repu as, as a result, nevertheless, whatever whatever the reasons are, as a result, his reputation is much better than those who were considered his peers. Uh, who went to Spain to fight, and like you say, he was also, uh, I think only Soult um, fought as long in Spain as, as Suchet. Yeah, um, I mean, it's a difficult one. Um, I, I do wonder whether sort of law of averages would mean that had Wellington faced Suchet, having bested Soult, Victor, Massena, Marmont, would Suchet have done anything radically different? Um, part of me is sceptical. Now, some will say, well, that's just you being a Briton full of British hyperbole. But I mean, just, just look at the record. Um, I, there's nothing that leads me to believe that Salt was a palpably better, a palpably worse commander than Suchet. And, and Salt did a, a seriously good job. Um, as we discussed in the first episode. So I'm reluctant to say that Suchet's reputation has been overblown, but I, I'm just not convinced that he's necessarily that much better than his contemporaries, much though he did a good job. And what I will not take away from him is his successful job as governor, which was mm -hmm. key. And I think that is, that's certainly something that's been missing from our conversations. A lot of these individuals, they're moving around, they're on active operations. We haven't looked at their styles as individuals trying to keep the populace happy. But Suchet succeeds where elsewhere in Spain, the Napoleonic regime doesn't do particularly well. Yeah, yes, this is absolutely true. We have slight... We, we've mentioned the looting of uh, Massena. Uh, we need to say that Sewell was little different. Um, and I don't, I think Marmont was too, it wasn't there long enough and he was mostly fighting. So I don't think he really had any civil or political responsibility particularly before he uh, was invalided out. So yes, yeah, Suchet absolutely is a much more capable general and governor and the probably the man napoleon probably like he's the of the caliber of men that napoleon probably needed in spain people guy who could perhaps pacify as well as conquer um and that is absolutely the case like you say and as i said before i think it's 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 an again it's an open question as to whether or not he's as good as people think he is just because he came out of spain well and like you say, he did get his army out as well, which is obviously quite a great feat as, um, as uh, you know, everything was falling apart when he had to get out. Um, but you, uh, I've tried to look at his, um, I've tried to look at his re record afterwards. And uh, uh, in 1815, obviously he was given, he, he went to uh, Napoleon, went, 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 went back to Napoleon, um, but, was unable to defend the uh, southern frontier against the Austrians and was being convincingly forced back when uh, news of uh, the fall of Paris reached him and the armistice. Um, I'm not sure if what that indicates precisely. Well, the numbers are not hmm. in his favour, are they? Which, no, which doesn't help no, the situation. He was, he was driven out of the passes, and there's a part of me that thinks that you should be able to hold passes, but still, it's true. He was up against it. Um, not clear at all, like Marmont. Um, I mean, he's one of those who's eventually forgiven by the Bourbons, isn't he, in 1819? Yeah. But then actually decides to stay in retirement, despite it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so definitely a very interesting guy. Not a guy a lot of people know about. To great to, to a great extent, um, for some reason or other, you'd think he'd be sort of the hat that hat that hat uh, that people defending the French army in Spain would want to wear, but um, 
but apart from he was but uh, but all, all i can say about him is, is essentially that he is exactly what is on the tin he was very successful in his theater the only theater in spain that showed any any success was his any sort of sustained success i should say i guess was his and um it's it's anybody's guess what would have happened if he'd been up against Wellington. I like you actually think that he was probably he, he doesn't seem as brilliant as Marmor. He doesn't seem as talented as Messina. And he doesn't see and he seems only as good Sul, I would think. Um and prob maybe not even as good as Sul, I'm not sure. Um but certainly as good as Sul. Not uh Sult wouldn't be worse than him, like you said. And that gives me to believe that there's a probably a high percentage that Wellington would have treated him like he treated all the others. But nevertheless, open question. It is, it is. And it's an interesting one that people might want to pick up uh, online. There's another question that I think we have to ask ourselves just before we wrap all of this up, which is of the generals as opposed to the marshals who serve in Spain. Who strikes you as an individual who did very well, but perhaps has been overlooked? I mean, the one for me that I've mentioned already is Clausel and what he managed to do to the French army of Portugal in the 1812 campaign. Um, another contender perhaps might be Caffarelli for his occupations with the army of the north, but then the, what happens in 1812 there isn't a hugely mm. successful campaign. So I'm inclined to give it more to Clausel. What's your sense? Mm. It, that's actually a very interesting question. It's not one I've given a lot of thought to. Um, the, I guess, divisional commanders, uh, I guess they would be. Uh, you have people like um, Foy. He was solid, I think. Um, not independent command, I don't think. I think he was mostly serving under people, so less less a general of independent command, but definitely a one who is was respected. Um, I think I agree about Clausel that well, what he managed to achieve in, I mean, first of all, he knew not to defend Madrid. Give it up. That will give give the dog a bone, and I will be able to escape. That in itself is a, a nice psychological insight, which will allow the French army to rally. And so I think I think I would agree about Clausel possibly being uh, the overlooked overlooked star, perhaps, of, of the French army in Spain. Um, I believe I believe Ray had a um, had a decent decent stint in Spain as well. Foy and Troy were two of the guys who annoyed Napoleon at Waterloo by trying to tell him how to, beat, to fight Wellington for certain. Um, and he ignored them, but... Well, Foy was well placed to, uh, to know, of course, having been at Salamanca, because it's, I believe it's Foy who says of Salamanca that this battle raises Wellington almost to the level of Marlborough. It was a battle in the style of Frederick the Great, um, and it, when you when you look at the scale of success at Salamanca, it's difficult to argue with that. You know, this guy knew what he was talking about. So, um, and for the French, if you compare a British general to Marlborough, that's a big deal because they mm. actually had a great deal of respect for Marlborough. There are songs written about Marlborough in France about yeah. how basically they wish he was dead because he was <laughs> such a problem. You know, it, I. Uh, it's it's I forget the I forget how to say the name, but it's um, it's set to the tune of for he's a jolly good fellow. I think it's something like Marlborough said Vant de Guerre or something like that. Marlborough Marlborough has gone away from the war, and so for a French general to say that about an English general to compare him to Marlborough, that's actually a really really big deal. <laughs> and so yeah, Foy Foy was also I believe. One, he he was able to extract his division from Southern Anchor as was, well. Yeah, yeah. Um, but he, I mean, it was Ferry was who, fast, uh, yeah, Ferry who made the stand and ended up. I think it was cut in half by Cannonball in the end, wasn't he? Um, 
yeah, it was an unpleasant way to go. Yeah. But they they stood. But yeah, Foy Foy got his division away. I, mean, British, I think British artillery at Salamanca. Seriously, incredible. <laughs> it really was. Josh, this has been absolutely fantastic. Thank you very much for joining me. Remind people where they can find out more about you and your YouTube channel uh, and your Twitter handle. Okay, well, uh, easy, the easy thing to do is just to uh, go to the website adventuresinhistoryland.com and if you find me there, you'll find me everywhere. But if you just want to go to Twitter, I am at Land of History. And if, I, if you want to go straight to YouTube, where I have videos with uh, uh, a well well known face on this on this podcast, uh, Marcus Cribb about the Duke of Wellington. Uh, then uh, you find me at Adventures in History Land there as well. Also stuff about the Russian campaign, with Jimmy Chen, and uh, I am on Facebook just under my own name, Joshua Proven. And but but easy easy, just go to the website adventuresinhistoryland.com, and if you find me there, you'll find me everywhere. And tell people about your book as well. My book at the second, uh, my first book, first book uh, is at the second available on Amazon, uh, may be available in stores. I've not actually been in a bookstore this year for, uh, for, for reasons. Uh, so I don't know whether it's on shelves, but my book, my first book, my book, which is out at the moment is called Wild East, the British in Japan, uh, 1854 to 1868. And it tells a story about Britain's first encounters, um, diplomatic encounters and military encounters with uh, the empire of uh, Japan. And you More to come next year. Yes, I was about to say, you've got a second one coming out, haven't you? Yes, I have a second one coming out next year, which is a slightly more germane to this channel, uh, which, is about the, which is about the British and Indian. Um, it is called um, Bullock's Crane and Good Madeira, uh, which, uh, and it focuses on the Maratha and Jat campaigns of 1803 to 1806, which is a fascinating subject. I loved researching it. It features the Duke of Wellington, it features Lord Lake, it features many famous and little known uh, Indian uh, characters. And um, the, the title itself is kind of a summary of what many officers seem to think you needed to fight in India. So certainly the Bullocks I would agree with. Um, as to the Madeira, well I'll, I'll leave that to uh, connoisseurs of, of, <laughs> of Madeira to, to comment on. Josh, it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much for joining me for what for us at least has been a, a marathon recording session. That was Josh Proven joining me in the second installment of a series on the Napoleon's Marshals which we irreverently called Boney's Boys in Spain. We will be continuing our series of special features on Napoleon's leading military lights in the new year. That wraps up Napoleon Month. A big thank you to everyone who has taken part. Josh, Will Fletcher, Jimmy Chen, Geraint Thatcher, Marcus Cribb, Vanya Bellinger, Rachel Stark, Luke Daly Groves, Gavin Lewis and Beatrice de Graaf. People are often kind enough to say really nice things about this podcast which I'm always very pleasantly surprised by. But the truth is that this channel only has the following that it does because of the hard work of my brilliant guests bringing you lively and engaging interviews. So frankly, the success of this podcast is down to them and them alone. Thank you also to everyone who's got involved with tweets, votes for Napoleon's greatest victory, social media posts, questions, forum comments, and shares. We didn't quite get Napoleon trending on Twitter, but that never really mattered. The point is that through lockdown, you hopefully have the chance to escape the despondency of the pandemic by having a chat about one of history's greatest and most controversial figures. The Napoleon Assist will return in December with weekly pods up until Christmas, including a reviews episode, an interview with Gareth Glover and a piece by me. In the meantime, if you are new here, please do scroll back over the previous listings on the Napoleon Assist there are now around 80 episodes to enjoy on a wide range of areas. And don't forget that some of these interviews can now be enjoyed on the Napoleon Assist YouTube channel. And if you're watching this on YouTube, please do hit the like and subscribe buttons and the notification bell so that you know as soon as the new episodes go live. If you're on Twitter and want to get in touch or join the discussion, you can find me at ZWhiteHistory and in the world's leading Napoleonic era forum, 
the Napoleonic Wars.net. Until next time, I'm Zach White. This has been Napoleon Month on The Napoleon Assist. Take care, my friends. Stay well, stay safe, stay kind. And as always, thank you for listening. Thank you.